Cinema Jaws is sponsored by Overcast, an independent podcast app that embraces the open world of podcasting instead of locking it down. No exclusives, no premium content, no paywalls. Just a great podcast app for everyone. Get it for free in the App Store. And we thank them for their support. You're listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location at Cards Against Humanity in Chicago. My name is Matt Kay, and with me is... Rye the Movie Guy, and sitting behind the glass, inside the fish tank, is... Phil me and Phil. How's it going, guys? This week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, we take a look at one of the great actresses working today. Indeed. Kate Blanchett, and we go our top five favorite scenes of Kate Blanchett. She is a national treasure, an international treasure, if you will. She is. And she also has a new movie coming out. Yeah, she does. I'm excited for it. We're going to go eye for an eye on that movie. And because of that, it got us thinking, looking at her filmography, it's just so large and so diverse. Very. We said, hey, let's talk about five great Kate Blanchett scenes. I watched a bunch the last couple of nights, and I'm anxious to talk about them. Yeah, well, hopefully you'll get 10 jawheads because we're going to try not to cross over. We'll see what happens. Yes. Besides that, uh, we have even more going on, don't we, Phil? Yes, right. We talked about a little bit already. We are also going eye for an eye on Where'd You Go, Bernadette, starring Kate Blanchett. And we have two reviews this week, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark and Blinded by the Light. Nice. We should have done dark light movies or something. Yeah. Well, we just did our dark scenes last episode. That's true. We did. (laughs) A lot of dark and light going on here, right? Well, getting ready for Halloween. I'm anxious to talk about both those movies, though. Me too. And because... We are going eye for an eye on Where Did You Go, Bernadette. I thought this is a good time to play Go Movie Trivia. And you hear it every time we do a new Riddle Jawheads. We give the option for a Jawhead to take Matt K on in trivia or to win a prize pack. Well, the July winner was Joe Marshall, and he writes us quite a bit. We know him as Flicker Joe. You probably heard us read some of his comments on the podcast. He decided to take Matt K on in trivia So, at the end of the show, we are going to Skype Flicker Joe, and he is going to take you on in Go Movie Trivia. I'm nervous, man. Flicker Joe knows his stuff. He's always writing in to correct us if when we when we have a flub. Very very nicely. Oh yes. Always happy to hear uh, from Joe. He he, he's one of my uh, the favorite emails. I I love to read are from Flicker Joe because he's, you know, he's enjoying the show, but he's got. some criticisms of what we've made wrong or suggestions. I would say input. Yeah, in very good input. And, and things like, hey, you should check out this movie as well. Or, boy, you guys missed this one. For sure. So I, I also love hearing from, from Joe. Yes. First time Flicker Joe will be on the show. That'll happen in trivia. Exciting. Yeah, man. Looking forward to that. And also, also, we have another announcement. I mean, these announcements have been coming left and right. First, Dropping bombs yeah, here. Yeah, first... I announced that we'll be at the Toronto International Film Festival. And then we did a a Patreon special, and I made an announcement there. But it should also be known uh, at the top of the show that I had gotten a call from my high school, former high school, and they want to induct me into the Fine Arts Hall of Fame. For your high school. Right. Yeah. uh, For doing, you know, criticism of film and cinema jaw, Ride the movie guy and all this stuff. I mean, (laughs) I may have made this joke on Patreon as well, but... You, you really have to put me in your... Uh... <laughs> Acceptance speech. I don't know if there will be a speech. I actually talked to them since that uh, recording, and they just talked about really just briefly the ceremony, and then I get to bring guests and whatnot. But there'll be a picture and a profile put up uh, in sort of like this ring of You don't get to thing. speak to... I'm, I'm not positive. I'm not sure. It's going to be your one chance to give like a commencement address, man. You got to like tell them to, you know, if stay so, foolish, stay hungry. If I do get to give a speech for going into the Fine Arts Hall of Fame of Nazareth Academy, I will record it and we'll put it on Cinema Jump. Oh my God, yes, <laughs> we have to. That is amazing. Okay, so that was an announcement. And then another announcement on this show in the Fish Tank segment, Phil has an announcement that the Jawheads will want oh, to Oh, so we're going we're gonna to wait for Fish Tank? Yes. Okay. Sound good? Sounds good. I like, wow. uh, sus- I like the suspense. I do too. This is exciting. It is. 
All right, so we got a lot going on this episode, man. It's a jam-packed jaw as always, Ryan. Yes, so let's get it rolling. It is Morgan Freeman month. We are celebrating the man. The great Morgan all Freeman. August. Do you got a fact for us? I sure do, Ryan. This week's Morgan Freeman fact. When he's not busy being the good guy in movies, Morgan Freeman is being a nice guy in the real world. Through the Rock River Foundation, an organization which he started, Freeman has donated millions to educational programs. He has also raised money for victims of Hurricane Katrina, and in 2004, he helped organize relief funds for hurricane victims in Granada. What a good guy. He awesome. Is, yeah. I, I love hearing these facts because when we celebrated Keanu Reeves, uh, we heard about how generous he is. Yeah. And a lot of times because we're not celebrating, you know, and looking for these facts, we don't hear about their generosity. But I could see Morgan Freeman... Doing, doing the good for the people. That right? makes sense. Yeah, it really does. It does. Good stuff. He just seems like a dude you'd love to hang out with. I agree. Have a beer with him and talk movies and yeah. life. I'd probably be out of my depth with, uh, with a Morgan Freeman. He just seems like really smart. Yeah, you would be. He'd wipe the floor yeah, with me. Yeah, you would be. Yeah. There's no doubt. Yeah. I would talk to him. All right. Uh, let's keep it rolling with Eye for an Eye. Yes. This week on Eye for an Eye, where'd you go, Bernadette? A loving mom becomes compelled to reconnect with her creative passions after years of sacrificing herself for her family. Her leap of faith takes her on an epic adventure that jumpstarts her life and leads to triumphant rediscovery. Based on the best-selling book of the same name, this film stars Kate Blanchett as Bernadette, and also in the cast are Kristen Wiig, Lawrence Fishburne, and Billy Crudup. It is directed by Richard Linklater, the man behind such great films as Dazed and Confused, Beyond, Before Midnight, and many, many more. Rye, we throw it on over to you, pal. Wow. So I've seen the trailer. Mm. So I have actually, I. I actually got a bad vibe from the trailer. Interesting. I got this vibe that the movie, uh, as far as the comedy, was trying too hard to get laughs. I haven't read the book. I don't know much about the story. Going from the vibe, and I do love Kate Blanchett, but I, I just am not sure I'm going to dig this one. I'm giving it an ignore. Whoa. Wow. Wow. Shocking. I know. You're going to give a Linkletter movie? I love Linkletter. I love Kate Blanchett. I don't know. There's something about the trailer that just rubbed me the wrong way. Well, it could just be a crappy trailer. It could be. It could be. But I, I, that's what I'm judging on. Interesting. Well, in all honesty, I found the trailer to be a little bit suspect as well. It kind of seems like a wannabe Wes Anderson feeling to it. And it didn't hook me at all. So maybe it is a crappy trailer. Ignore. Wow, we throw it into the fish tank. Where do you stand on Bernadette? So my big thing, I haven't seen the trailer, but the synopsis is, uh, it reminds me a little bit of Tully in that it's the kind of movie that's going to make me feel a lot of guilt um, for going to art school <laughs> um, and and requiring a lot from my mom. And yeah, I don't really make like you want to call feeling. your mom, yeah. <laughs> I call my mom a lot anyways, but again, like I, there's a lot of guilt that comes with that. So for that reason, I, I'm also kind of going ignore calls his mom you're like hey mom what's for dinner no more like can i have help with rent (laughs) she wishes she was just cooking me food three ignores for where did you go bernadette kind of shocking it is but we're gonna see it we're gonna see it we'll get a a report on it yeah there's no doubt it's just that we're not very excited for it i guess not very excited yeah Um, Speaking of new movies, though, Matt. Yes, Ryan, back in 1981, a book by Alvin Schwartz with horrifying illustrations by Stephen Gamel took children's literature by storm. Some places vilified the book. Some places banned it from school libraries. It developed quite a reputation. Growing up in the 80s and 90s, the book was almost a dare, secreted away under beds and read by flashlight under the covers. Which would be the place you might want to spend the night after reading scary stories to tell in the dark? In today's world of IP mining, YA trash on the screen, reboots and sequels, frankly, it's amazing that it has taken 38 years for said book to reach the screen. But reach it, it has. The question is, will it be any good? Ryan and I peeked out from under the covers just long enough to watch it and find out. Hey, what's going on? Tommy's missing. Tommy's name was in the book. There's no way it's actually connected, right? Okay, what if what happens in the book is exactly what's happened for real? Oh my God. Augie! Stella! Listen, you're in the next story. We're reading it right here. It's a corpse looking for her missing toe. 
Ryan, here's what you need to know. On a scary and mischievous Halloween, four kids break into an abandoned house. Legend has it that the house is haunted, Ryan, by the spirit of Sarah Bellows, who told scary stories to children through the wall of the room she was kept locked in. Stories scary enough to kill. Lo and behold, the four discover a secret room in Sarah's book of scary stories. Suddenly, new stories are being written in the pages of the book, and one by one, people are disappearing. Oof. That's the setup for scary stories to tell in the dark. Yes. Okay, I have not read the book, and you have. Yeah, it's been a long time, but I, I've read it multiple times. When we went eye for an eye on this last week, and from the trailers that I saw, I knew that these were going to be somewhat, in a way, separate stories, and that this would be, in, in a way, almost like an anthology. Almost. Right? They tie it together. It's not an anthology. And it's not. So that's the first thing that I really liked was the way the film and the stories uh, were presented because it, it more or less just flows as one big narrative, but they are sort of in their own way separate stories of what's happening to the characters as these new pages by Sarah Bellows is being, are being produced. Written. You know? Yeah, I like that quite a bit. And the stories themselves become one of the characters. They are the villain. They are the, the killer. Uh, which is cool. It's not like Final Destination. Death is the killer. Or in a Friday the 13th, Jason is the killer. Here, the stories are the killer. And yeah, it's Sarah Bellows, but she's sort of um, not an embodied character for the most part. She's more of an idea. Right. Also, though, I liked how when the characters went into the house for the first time, mm -hmm. which was this abandoned house, had a great atmosphere about it. And they finally get into that secret room that you described and they find the book. That was just the setup. And that's pretty scary in itself but that's before the book has actually been opened up and stories and and weird stuff is going to happen while these stories are being written so i enjoyed the whole setup of before they even found the book there's a bully with a bat uh and that kid is just creepy looking mm. and and something does happen to him later on but him his just his character is sort of demented, I think, is a word for it. It's perfect. I mean, they, they, let's talk about the tone of the movie because they capture that. Um, uh, it, it's set during the height of the Vietnam War. Nixon yeah. is about it, to take office. It, the year is 1968. Right. Uh, it's Halloween a, night, 1968. Tumultuous time in American history, to say the least. And I feel that they captured the tone of that sort of the uncertainty of the times. I mean, things were changing pretty rapidly in 1968. And they, they, they just sort of marry that in without it feeling like a shoehorn. You get a little bit of a, a, a political flavor here that, that sort of is relevant today without it being um, heavy-handed. And the tone of the throwback to the, the original Halloween movie the scary movies of, of yesterday, even some 80s, just a little touch of 80s, just fantastic. This is a movie that's ostensibly for kids. And, dude, I think children will be terrified by this. Well, Absolutely I was, terrified. I was going to ask because I think you're a better judge of what's scary for kids because you have a couple of kids. I do. So I was sitting there and was thinking to myself, I wonder who the studio thought they were making this movie for because... Mm. I agree with you. This isn't really for kids under 12, I wouldn't say. I think they would all be scared. But that's the thing about the book. The book was for kids, I guess, maybe, you know, 12 to, to 15, let's say. It's a children's book, but it's freaking terrifying. And largely due, largely, largely due to uh, Stephen Gamel's artwork. And I apologize if I'm mis mispronouncing his name, but his art is so off-putting and unsettling and i was really happy to see that the movie took extra care to capture some of his characters properly and and with uh, I, I almost want to say a loving homage to to his illustrations there have been later editions of the book that did not include his illustrations and there was a public outcry like uh that people were incensed that they wouldn't include his illustrations it's almost like part of the book and what made it so scary and i guess that is a very roundabout way of saying i think this is a bold move 
putting out a children's horror movie that is really a, a horror movie that would scare many adults and scared me, but I applaud it. Mm. There, there was some terminology used in the movie, it derogatory towards certain characters that we just don't see, but it was 1968 that I was somewhat shocked by. Yeah. Because, it, it's again, it's supposed to be a kid's movie, but... Well, I mean, I think one of the functions of good horror is to also show the horror of reality, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah, it's a scary story. There's going to be ghosts and skeletons and things jumping out at you. But you know what? There's also war and there's also racism and there's also uh, oppression and things like this in the world. And horror is an allegory to sort of uh, shed light on those topics that we find uh, unsavory. And I think this movie did it so well. I do, too. And I, I like the fact that characters are going to die. I'm not going to give spoilers out. But the movie goes, you know, through several stories. And let's just say not everybody's safe. And I appreciate that because I thought for sure going into this movie, knowing that it was based on a, a children's book, I thought, well, it's going to be scary, but nobody's really going to be harmed. Not the case. Right. Nobody's being smashed over the head with giant mallets like in other horror movies we've seen this summer. You're not going to get slow motion uh, faces being destroyed. But yeah, I, th there's no gore per se, but there are some kind of graphic images and some creatures and ghosts that I think will, you know, be kind of nightmare inducing. The imagery is the sell point if you're looking for the horror aspect of some it all. Great body horror. I love the look of the scarecrow. Yeah. Creepy. And then and not that's only... The, right from the illustration. Right. And not just the look of the scarecrow, but also that it has those like beetle-like bugs mm. crawling in and out of its mouth and uh, any, any hole that it has on its mm. face. There's right, bugs right moving around it. Right from the illustration again, yeah. Really vivid and pretty creepy. Oh, yeah. There's also a scene where a particular character can uh, knock his body parts off and reconfigure his body. Mm. Awesome. Really looked awesome. Yeah, crazy creature. Really cool creature. Those are all the positives. What about the? What about the? Um, I don't want to spoil anything here, but there's there's a uh, a character who again will be familiar to to fans of the book. Uh, she's walking down the hall in the red room. Wild, right? That character really? design. You like that one? Oh yeah. Scary. I don't know if that one worked for me as much. Really? Yeah. Oh, so insane. Mm. I liked it. The, the thing that didn't work for me the most, and I think what uh, two deterrents for the movie for me, I don't know if the cast was all that strong. Now I kept trying to decide. A lot of times you got to look and maybe compare movies that this can be comparable to, and one of those obvious ones is It from last year, where you have a group of young kids on somewhat of an adventure that involves a horror movie. Very similar in, mm. in that, at least from that aspect. Right. This okay. is way more innocent than It. Right. Wholeheartedly. But I like that group of characters a lot in It. Compared to here, I think it dropped the ball. There is humor. There's characters that have some funny lines. But all of it fell flat for me. I mean, there, there's one time where uh, the character talks about uh, his banana. It, it's just a, a quick like that? throwaway line, but it just felt so forced. And I thought, I want to laugh at something like that. I know what they were going for, for us to start to get along with these kids. Never felt it at all. There, that that gang of friendship, flat, non-existent in the movie for me. It's not the Goonies. I'm agreeing with you on that one, Ryan. There, there is something to be desired from the acting, although I think some of the dramatic beats were actually handled really well, especially by the female lead. And I, I yes, you're right. This is not the Goonies. It's not Steven Spielberg. You don't get that loser club feel. But I thought the kids acted well enough, and the subject matter carries it through. All right, breaking it down a little bit further, something else you wanted to highlight or, uh, you know, any negativity, something? For me, there was a, a two great scenes, and I think one was so well done where a character was hiding under, under his bed. Yes. And it, everything of the pacing of that scene is done so well, and the camera, where it's looking, where the character's looking, the way they place the camera under the bed, looking out, and you know that kind of view where they're looking to see the footsteps of someone coming in the room, and the anticipation... It's the big toe, by the way. Yeah. yeah the, the anticipation that it builds in the audience. I think that story Oof. built it the best. I and agree. I, I really do wish the, the whole movie could have had as the, the patience and the buildup as that one, because I think that was the perfect story to tell. 
I agree. I think you're that right. Scene. Yeah, that 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 definitely was of all the stories in the movie the best one. And I got physically nauseated by it at one point, and I don't want to spoil anything, so I'll keep exactly which point to myself. But uh, the under the bed part was genuinely terrifying. So yeah, man. For a negativity, like I mentioned, the cast, and then also when they got to a, a hospital, which the characters get to, it, it, there, there's a little bit of a lull there for a, a little while. I, I, they, they could have trimmed that down by about 10 minutes. And then it picks back up. I'm not saying it doesn't, but there's just a little lull there that I, I was like, come on already. And I felt me, myself wanting to check my watch. And I wish I wasn't. Negativity for me, there's a scene where the young lady is calling her dad from a police station. And the conversation is overheard by the cops, yet they do nothing to intervene or, or like say, hey, hold on, let me get on this phone call. It's kind of I, ridiculous. I, I didn't know what the, the, the cops' relationship to like where we were supposed to take them as serious because they came off like goofballs. I think you just have to have fun with it I at guess. that point. Yeah. yeah. Influences here, you actually named one for me. Final Destination to some degree. I think because the stories are writing themselves and each character is in danger. Yeah, and they know it. Uh, also, the the mystery with a with a very uh, ominous clock counting down to your death. I would put the ring into contention as an influence. Flavors of the ring. Also, the uh, Sarah Bellows character has sort of like been tortured and locked away, like Samara was in the ring. So that's true. Yeah, yeah, good one. Uh, did you learn anything? Uh, you know, just the standard horror movie stuff, like don't go in that room, that that sort of thing. I guess if you find a mysterious book in a house that was supposed to be haunted and it was haunted by a girl who told stories that were so scary they killed people, don't take her book of stories. Hmm. You know? Yeah. That's like kind of 101. I learned it, it's okay to go to the drive-in by yourself. Just hang out in your car and watch a movie by yourself. Have you ever gone to a drive-in? Never. Me neither. No. Nope. We got to make that a goal for 2020, dude. Wouldn't be bad. It's, I mean, hey, maybe 2019. Let's, let's pull Even that Even record off. the jaw. Inside the car, watching I, I, a movie. I don't know. That's a little creepy. I mean, don't don't people <laughs> seriously? Do people actually watch the movies at the? At a I, yeah, nowadays I think it Bluetooths to your radio in your car, and you get pretty good sound if you got a stereo system in there. All right, I want to see what it's all about. How about a movie poster quote, Matt K? All right, uh, how about horror for kids that will also scare their parents? Pretty literal. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's right on the nose. What I do you went got? with. Not as good as it, but fun. I mean, yeah, I don't think it's trying to be it. I, I'm, but trying to put a comparison. The Jawheads see that on the poster. They know exactly what it means. You have to sort of see this movie through the lens of a kid going to the movies. And it's going to scare the crap out of kids. Mm. Kids won't go see it. The kids shouldn't go see it. Kids should go see scary stories to tell in the dark. Uh, and I can't wait to tell Parker. I mean, I'm going to dare him to see it. It's mm. it's uh, It'll be his first, like, true horror movie. One other thing? Anything else? Yeah, I wanted to mention that, obviously, this is a series of books. And do they do they set it up for the sequels? I think it's something everybody's going to be wondering going in. And spoiler alert, if you don't want to know, skip 30 seconds. Yes, they set it up for some sequels. And I think they did it with class and panache. And uh, I'm excited for the sequels. I How many Jaws, Matt K? It's a solid three. It's a solid three. I'm going to go two and a half Jaws. That's probably accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Three Jaws for Matt K. Two and a half Jaws for Rye the Movie Guy. I had a ton of fun um, with it. Scary stories to tell in the dark. If you see the movie and you have Twitter pulled up, shoot us a tweet at CinemaJaw or write us an email feedback at CinemaJaw.com. Kate Blanchett was not in the film. I know. What was she doing? She really missed a good one to be in. But that is our topic this week. Our top five favorite Kate Blanchett scenes. Okay. We usually ask the guest, Matt, was this mm. a fun list to come you up with? You can ask me. Was it challenging, mm -hmm. Matt? Yeah. Challenging is all hell. So I learned that there are a lot of Kate Blanchett movies that I have missed. It's on me. I should watch more of them. The ones I have seen, I like quite a bit. So I'm excited to get things started this week. At number five, I have a scene I am dubbing Return to Me. John Cusack plays a air traffic controller. Oh, my God. In the movie. Come on, really? dude. Really? Hey, it's number five, man. I had to <laughs> dig deep. Wow. 
No, this was a cute I, I, scene. I forgot she was even in this movie. Oh, no, it's a cute scene. So he's basically uh, wooing his, his girlfriend over the radio from the air traffic control tower. And they, What's the movie? Tell the movie. Pushing Tin there we is go. the name of the movie. Surprisingly good, actually. I is li- it? Yeah, it does. I don't, I don't remember it being good. I liked it. Can we throw that in the fish tank? How, what, what it was on Rotten Tomatoes? I think this is a crapper, it's, but okay. It's John Cusack, Billy Bob Thornton, and Kate Blanchett. What's not to like, Ryan? <laughs> What's not to like? Well, John Cusack, Billy Bob Thornton. I'm joking. Really? I'm joking. Jesus. I'm joking. Anyway, they, they have this uh, moment where he starts singing Return to Me to her, and she uh, lends a little duet to it, and lo and behold, she's got a great voice. I like it. It's a sweet moment. It's funny. Yeah. It's romantic. Wow. We, Kate, if you're listening, we apologize. <laughs> I'm sure she'd be right now. What the they hell? They can't is all Matt, be Oscar bait, Ryan. What the hell is Matt Kay talking about? I like about? me some pushing tin. All right, my number five comes from a film that was a biopic. Came out in 2007, and a lot of complaints. People who don't like biopics will always say they're not creative enough. They're not different enough. You know, it's always see the same exact beats. Mm-hmm. But in 2007, we got a biopic that had to be different because the person they were covering is uh, so unique. And that person being Bob Dylan. And the film was I Am Not There. And in, I think, six different actors played Bob Dylan through the years. And can we throw that into the fish tank? All the actors who played Bob Dylan. Didn't Tilda get in there? I'm not, no, though it was Kate Blanchett. So that's what you're thinking. So Kate Blanchett played Bob Dylan uh, in one particular phase it's of his vignette. career. Yeah, yeah. And the scene that I wanted to highlight was basically a press conference, and it's probably the scene that has the most heart in the movie. She is playing Bob Dylan at a press conference where everybody is is asking Bob Dylan if folk music can have an influence on people, start a revolution, where, where and what exactly does music mean in a movement, you know? And her mannerisms are such like... Bob Dylan, you know, and she carries herself in the way that, like, we know Bob Dylan to be. So, A, it's not, you're not even shocked that a woman is playing Bob Dylan, and B, it's it's probably the best Bob Dylan performance in the film. It's amazing. And well, watching I mean, who, it again. Who hasn't been working on their Bob Dylan impersonation? Oh, I for, can't for, do one at hey, all. Hey, you can't do Bob Dylan? Come on. Well, you can't, obviously. I mean, it's better than yours. Let's hear what you got. <laughs> what was that? He mumbles a lot. He, he does mumbles. mumbles. But he yes, does mumble. if you have not seen I'm Not There, it's it's terrific. And and Kate Blanchett in it playing Bob Dylan is something to behold. That's well, my number five. Wow, we just both did Bob Dylan impersonations very poorly. At number four, if you have the good fortune to cast a Kate Blanchett in your movie, you'd have to be a madman to cover her in face mask a hood, and protective glasses. But that's exactly what Edgar Wright did in Hot Fuzz. And it is a hilarious scene because Simon Pegg comes in to break up with Kate Blanchett because he's he's married to his work, Ryan, as a a policeman. And she's a a crime scene investigator or or cleanup. She's in the full hazmat gear, you know, because they're dealing with uh, body fluids and stuff. So... He actually starts addressing the wrong person right when he walks in. Have you seen this? <laughs> I forgot about it. And and he he breaks up with her and she she plays it like the straight man so well. I think people don't give her enough credit for her comedic timing, but it's impeccable. It's it's really such a a taut scene with such dry British humor and it is largely due to Kate Blanchett's comedic timing. It's fantastic. I got to see Hot Fuzz again. Dude, I do you really it, do? I watched it twice. I missed it in the theater. I watched it on DVD like two times within a three-day span, you know? Yeah. And then that was it. I haven't seen it since. It's been a while for me, too. I think we should watch the entire, um, what is it called? They, they call it, it's named after some candy with the red, blue, and green. Um, anyway, we should watch all three of them. I like it. Yeah. All right. My number four is one of her performances that won an Academy Award. This was for Best Supporting. At number four. Yes. Okay. Uh, she she's she's won Best Supporting Actress and she's won Best Actress at number four. This was for Best Supporting. Came out in two thousand and four. You're working with Martin Scorsese 
and you're working with Leo DiCaprio in The Aviator. And this is where Kate Blanchett portrays Catherine Hepburn. I got this too. So what scene have you got? I have the golf scene. That's exactly what I got. You do? Yeah, yeah. Number two, man. What do you got? Three more above this? Yes. Jesus. We should have we should have cross referenced. Hughes uh, takes her out on a date and they go golfing, and she just absolutely commands the scene. Yeah. He almost doesn't even get a word in. She's constantly talking, answering her own questions, uh, making statements. I'm not outdoorsy. I'm athletic. <laughs> I sweat. Damn it. That's not bad at all. Yeah. She does a great Hepburn. Oh, Better it's than so her funny. Dylan. I, oh, I don't know. I mean, they're both pretty fantastic. And, and who hasn't been working on their Catherine Hepburn? <laughs> right? But she really owns it, you she know? She does. I mean, she plays it, like, for laughs just the, the perfect amount. I mean, it's, like, just enough of a caricature, but still... Honest. Honest. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, Hepburn was quite a character, wasn't mm-hmm. she? She was. Absolutely, man. And that's what I'm talking about with that dry comedic timing. She's, I think, maybe growing up uh, with, with the, you know, that, that tradition of comedy around sort of informed her, her sensibilities. That was my number four, The Aviator. I think it's way too low. Wow. Into our threes we go. All right. Uh, this, is, this is, you know, I'm still having fun here, right? Number three, this is where I put The Destruction of Molnir by Hela, Who? Goddess of Death. What? I mean, I think we were... What are you talking about? We were all a little shocked (laughs) when Kate Blanchett was cast in the next Thor movie, right? I mean, not since they cast Natalie Portman in the first Thor movie were we quite this shocked at a Thor cast member. But lo and behold, here's Kate Blanchett, and she catches Mjolnir right out of the air. This is Thor's hammer, if you don't know. He flings it at her. I didn't know. You didn't know? I didn't know. (laughs) What did you think I was talking about? I wasn't positive. Oh, okay. <laughs> not joking either. His hammer is named Molnir. I had no idea. I mean, when you're as cool as Thor, you name your damn hammer, right? So he flings it at her head. She catches it in midair. One of the more shocking moments in the entire MCU history, she shatters it with her, with her bare it. hand. Loved it. Yeah. There were audible gasps in the theater when it happened. That's I can well still remember be. it. Yeah. People were like, oh, my God. And I was chuckling because I always get such a kick out of everybody being so into their, their Marvel. You know, I thought, oh, my God, I was a little shocked, but I, I really got a kick out of everybody just gasping in the theater. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's sort of, uh, it, it was a symbol of Thor's uh, power, and she just crushed it in her hands. What a film, too. Yeah. Probably one of the best ones in the MCU. She knows how to have fun with a character, doesn't she? Yeah. I don't know if that villain is, like, going to be pointed to as one of the best MCU villains, mm. but it's definitely better than most of them. And it's that, a fun one, for sure. A lot of fun. And that moment in particular was, uh, was really good. I, I think they could have done more, but that wasn't on Cape Blanchett. That was the writing. Into my number three, much more serious than Thor. This was a film that she did with Rooney Mara called Carol. Yeah. And I, you could pick a couple of great scenes in this movie, and it's a beautiful film if you haven't seen it. I haven't seen shot. it. I got to catch up with it. And the one I ended up picking, I was going to go at the end of the film, which... I, I think it's just magical. It's one of those movie moments at, at an end of the film where you think, yes, perfection, and so great. But I really did want to highlight this scene where uh, Blanchette, who plays Carol, is in a room with her ex-husband, who is actually played by Kyle Chandler. And they're having a custody meeting with about four lawyers, all male. So so Carol, Kate Blanchett, is the only female in the room. And the way the lawyers are talking is uh, who's going to get custody because it has become apparent that Carol um, has had lesbian feelings for Rooney Mara's character. Mm. And this is, you know. Shocking. Yes. Back in the day when this was like, oh, my God, I got to yank my hair out. You can't do that. So they, they were saying that you cannot have custody of the daughter. But what's happening in that room and at that moment is lawyers talking about uh, – a child in a way that it's almost like a commodity. Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? And she has this moment where she just says, what are we talking about? This is about our daughter and what's best for her. And, you know, she loves me and she loves you. And we both love this child. And what do we do to make sure that, you know, she has the best life possible? And she makes, don't want to give it away if you haven't seen Carol, she makes a decision in the room. Um, That's a, you know, difficult decision to make. But it's the way she commands the room. You know, she stands up 
and just takes over the scene. And it's a, a powerful moment, an emotional moment. It's what I would call a Kate Blanchett moment. Hmm. She sure can command a moment. Yes. No doubt about it. Carol, if you haven't seen it, well worth your time. That was my number three. All right. Swings it around back to me. And this is where I have Katie plays golf. There's a lot of great scenes, though. I, I, I think in The Aviator, Hepburn's character continues. They, they have that moment in the car where he's Howard Hughes has just um, come off of eating ice cream straight from the container. Do you remember this? Yes. It's sort of later in their relationship, and she's like, don't answer the phone, and he answers the phone, and she's like, don't put the ice cream on the table. He puts it on the table, <laughs> and then uh, it cuts to them driving to the studio. He's going to drop her off. He's talking about the, the, the goose flying thing that he made. What was that thing called? Throw it in the fish tank. It's like the it's great something goose. Like the goose, right. I can't remember. Giant goose. It's the biggest plane ever, I think, <laughs> at the time. Anyway, she uh, walks into the makeup room, turns on the light, and there's a, a friend of hers there, and, and they have this brief exchange, and she just breaks down. And you could see the like her armor just sort of comes off in that moment. It's, it's a great little acting beat. So mm. that's my audible. Awesome. Uh, my number two film, Kate Blanchett has worked with Woody Allen one time, and she was rewarded with the Best Actress. So this is where she gets her second Oscar. The film, of course, was Blue Jasmine, and it's a tour de force of a performance, right? I mean, the whole entire movie is actually phenomenal and completely carried by her. It's one of those, when I looked back at it, I was watching part of the movie yesterday, I thought, if... If she doesn't do such a phenomenal job, the movie's actually kind of blah. Hmm. You know, it really comes down to the performance of, of Kate Blanchett. And it's bookended by two great scenes, and I'll just combine the two sort of as my number one pick. But I love the way the film opens. And this is, we, we meet Jasmine on an airplane next to an old lady. The relationship's unknown, but we hear her just rambling about her life talking, manically talking. Um, and then they cut to uh, walking uh, f- off the plane, you know, that long walk when you're on those w- moving uh, walkways. Sure, sure. And she's talking to the lady's ear off. And then they're at the, the luggage, and she's talking about another topic. And finally, the old lady sees her bag, and she gets the bag. And then she's like, oh, I got to go. And then she meets her husband, and they're like, who is that? She's like, I don't know, but she just talked my ear off the entire flight. And you all, you instantly get this idea that Jasmine is just someone that is just rambling on, just met this person who was talking. And of course, it ends, ending scene with her having a complete breakdown on the bench, talking to herself. The whole movie is, is fantastic, but I mm. love those, way it starts and way it finishes. The book awesome. ends. Really. Nice. Nicely done, Ryan. So that leaves us with our number ones. All right. I don't know what you have at number one. I but know. I know mine is actually from a smaller movie that I, I oh, think yeah. most jawheads are, are going to look forward to. So Mine is also from a very small movie. It is? Yeah. Very, very small. You're kidding me. No, tiny. Uh, this is the scene in The Fellowship of the Ring oh. where <laughs> Galadriel is offered... The Ring of Power by Frodo. And she said, and I've just rewatched this. I, obviously, I rewatched all of these. She says, You would give it to me freely. And then she launches into this like uh, little soliloquy where she takes on this giant form. And I actually don't like the special effects here because they sort of switch her to negative, And all of a sudden, she's like green. Yeah. And, and almost ghost like that weird f- look. Yeah. I don't mind how large she gets. Um, but I really wish I could see her um, facial expressions a little better. But that's a minor gripe because she, just the way she delivers this, like, all would love me and despair. She talks about how she's, she would become like this all-powerful being. Uh, it's a moment I remember from, from The Fellowship, probably one of the most striking moments in that movie. She also does the narration in the beginning of the movie, she which does. is quite beautiful i always loved the way the fellowship of the ring starts about who got the rings you know the different parts of the yeah. land i just love the way that movie starts and part of that is i think because of her narration no doubt about it I mean, we're always talking about you know morgan freeman who we're celebrating this month we're not taking anything away from morgan but kate's oh kate narration. can narrate mm-hmm. hell yeah so nice pick at number one my number one film i met up with jeff york at the screening for Scary Stories 
Oh, you did in the dark. Yeah. And before the movie started, he was asking me what the topic was going to be on this week. Did so you Did you guys him, hold hands during the scary no, parts? No, 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 no. But I was telling him about the Kate Blanchett mm-hmm. uh, top five, and he said, "Just tell me your number one." He's like, "I'm going to listen to the podcast, but tell me your number one." So I told it to him. He said, "Great number one." All right, I got Jeff's vote of confidence. Approval. Right. Well, let's see if you get mine right. Um, so this was. A smaller movie. It also starred Judy Dench. It came out in 2006. The movie is called Notes on a Scandal. Mm-hmm. And it's a complicated type story here. You got Kate Blanchett, who plays a school teacher who is married but is having an affair with a student. And that's the scandal. Um, but what you also have is that Judy Dench is an older teacher working at the school who basically is. Uh, all, all, but all alone, all alone and doesn't want to be friends with anybody. But no, not blackmailing her. She becomes friends with Kate Blanchett. But it ends up because she's in love with Kate Blanchett and she thinks she's going to have a relationship with her. And the ending scene is, it's literally off the rails. But the two actually, I watched it again, have a physical fight. We got... Kate Blanchett slapping Judy Dench in the face multiple times. Right, who's a septuagenarian. Picking her up, like grabbing her by her clothes and slamming her into a, a cabinet. And at one point she yells, Barbara, I'm not a vampire! Something along these lines. And then she runs outside and the press had gathered because the scandal now was making papers that uh, this teacher was with a student. And she comes running out, her makeup's running down her face, and she just starts yelling, ah, you know, I'm here, and... What a, it's just such a moment. It's just like that boiling point moment of the film where it all just comes together. And it's awesome. It's awesome. So It's not as cool as when she broke Molnir with her bare hands. <laughs> it's up there, though. All right. A couple of honorable mentions I Go. got. Yeah. All right. Babel. I've talked about this movie um, a, a, a few times. And it's broken up to, into multiple um, storylines. And one of those storylines is... Brad Pitt and Kate Blanchett are a married couple, clearly having a, a squabble, and it really comes to fruition about what their differences are when they're they're having lunch, and she they're in a foreign country, and she doesn't want him to have ice in his drink, and the whole conversation that they have, awesome. One, two. How can you not mention Elizabeth? This was probably her biggest role her that breakout. got her name yeah. right, and. There's, there's a couple of great ones. When she talks to Queen Mary in the movie and Queen Mary pleads with her that uh, when she becomes Queen Elizabeth, uh, can you please, you know, keep the Catholic faith in, you know, the country? And she just starts this dialogue where you think she's going to go with it. And at the very end, she's like, I'm going to go with the way I should rule the country. It just turns against her right in her face, you know, is, honestly. And then last but not least... I love my Wes Anderson, and Kate Blanchett shows up in The Life Aquatic. I'm surprised this wasn't on your list. Well, I watched a couple scenes, and I thought, well, which one would I highlight? And they're, they're, they're just not the match- top matching five pajamas qualities. scene. But I do love one particular scene where she is talking to um, Owen Wilson, mm-hmm. and it, it's such funny dialogue, and and the comedic timing that she has like you had mentioned earlier yeah. is spot on for like perfect, a Wes Anderson perfect movie. for Wes Anderson so they're talking about you know if they're about to make love and he's talking about how Bill Murray's character he thinks likes her and it's just comedy at its best so I agree all right was that all of them that's all I got all right if we missed your favorite Kate Blanchett scenes and there are quite a few out there hopefully we'll get some more yes and you have Twitter pulled up shoot us a tweet at cinemajaw or you can write us feedback at cinemajot.com. What we're going to do is take a break. When we come back, a big announcement from Phil, plus another review of Blinded by the Light. I like what we did there. Scary stories to tell in the dark, Blinded by the Light. Oh, we got it all. I know. Not to mention, we're going to get Flicker Joe on the line to take you on in trivia. Stick with us. Let's all go to the lobby. In honor of Cinema Jaws Morgan Freeman Month, we get scolded by Morgan as he takes us on the rooftop and lean on me. What are you doing? What's up here? Let me tell you something. The trouble with being a teenager is you don't know nothing. 
problem with teenagers is you think you're smarter than people who've already been down the road you're traveling. You know what I'm trying to say to you, boy? Do you? Yes, sir. Did you tell your father I threw you out of school? Look at me, damn it! No, sir. Why not? No guts, huh? Afraid of what he's gonna say to you, aren't you? My father doesn't live with us anymore, sir. Oh, is that what you're doing now? Go around feeling sorry for yourself, boy? Huh? Go on, get out of here. You're wasting my time. Please let me back, sir. <laughs> I have to get back in school. I can't go home and tell my mom I got kicked out of school. Now, why should I let you back into my school, Sams? Because I'm going to do better, sir. How? By doing my work. What else? And staying out of trouble. What have you been thinking about all this time? Why should I believe you now? Because I changed my ways. I don't believe you, Sams. I don't think you've changed a thing. Go on, jump. No, I don't want to jump. Yes, you do. You smoke crack, don't you? You smoke crack, don't you? Look at me, boy. Don't you smoke crack? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Do you know what that does to you? Huh? No, sir. It kills your brain cells, son. It kills your brain cells. Now, when you're destroying your brain cells, you're doing the same thing as killing yourself. You're just doing it slower. Now, I say, if you want to kill yourself, don't fuck around with it. Go on and do it expeditiously. Now, go on and jump. Jump. No, I don't want to kill myself, sir. You're quite sure about this, are you? Yes, sir. All right, Sam, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back on my own word just this once and let you back into my school. Because you're still a baby and you don't know shit. Popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dead. I remember the first time I heard Cinnamon John. Sounded like a stiff wind would blow them over. That was my first impression of the show. Cinnamon John. The show that crawled through a river of shit and came out clean on the other side. It's a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. And we are back on Cinema Jaw. Just got a nice, healthy spoonful of Morgan Freeman there. Yeah, how I about for, it? I forgot that we had the Morgan Freeman impersonator in, in, in the can there. That's hilarious. I know. One of, one of my favorites. <laughs> you did we a gotta, pretty good job. We got to do that again. Get some more movie star impersonators. They were fun. They were. Love hearing that, Morgan Freeman. Um, Matt, before we get to Blinded by the Light review and before... We call Flicker Joe to take you on in trivia. We did throw a few items into the fish tank. Plus, we have an announcement. Let's open up that fish tank. Wait a moment. It's fish, isn't it? DC, wake up, wake up. It's an old pad. It's a giant glass bowl. Hey, get some fish, folks. Who's coming with me besides Flipper? Here. That's a certain message. It means Luca Brasi sleeps with the fishes. You're going to need a bigger boat. Yes, thank you guys so much for letting me out. Uh, I apologize to further any anticipation and suspense, but let's just get these questions out of the way real quick, and we'll get to the announcement afterwards. Uh, our first one, what does Pushing Tin have on Rotten Tomatoes? <clears throat> so Pushing Tin was not particularly well-received. Uh, it has it. a solid 48% rotten, Oof. with some of the highlighted critiques I found, and these are all quotes, being... It's so frustrating to see such a promising premise and such a delightful cast wasted. <laughs> That's just one man's opinion or woman's. Mediocre scripting and direction, which Two. is punctuated with an exclamation point. <laughs> uh, also, not, you know. <laughs> and uh, the last one that I thought was pretty good, a fast-paced, twisty-turning, high-fiving, but ultimately spiraling disaster of a movie. <laughs> Also punctuated with an exclamation point. Perfect. That's that's exactly the way I remember summing up. It's, <laughs> it's, it's divisive. Mm. It's polarizing. It's, no, it's it's just not that good. Hey, fifty percent. You know that means the other fifty percent liked it. Mm. All righty. Who played Bob Dylan in I Am Not There? There were six different actors who portrayed different parts of of Bob Dylan's musical career. Obviously, we mentioned Clay, Kate Blanchett, uh, but there was also Christian Bale. 
Marcus Carl Franklin, Richard Gere, Heath Ledger, and Ben Wishaw. Mm, there you go. None of those people I would peg, which I guess is what makes the movie work, mm-hmm. as a, is a uh, Bob Dylan. It's really good. All righty. Highly our, recommend. All righty. And our last one in here, what was the plane called in the Aviator? So the technical name for all the nerds out there is the Hughes H-4 Hercules, but better known in the film and to everybody as the Spruce Goose. Spruce Goose. That's what we're looking right, for. Right, because they built it out of wood. Right. Right. Spruce. I don't know if they built it out of wood. Yeah, they did. Spruce. Okay. That was the whole thing. Like, you got to find a wood that's light but strong. It was spruce. Mm. Spruce goose. Nobody wanted to be in that plane on its maiden voyage. But it does fly. It do- Oh, it does. Like the wind. I like that scene in the movie. It's pretty cool. It's very cool. So we did promise an uh, announcement from Phil. Do I need anything further, Matt? Phil's been with us for uh, quite a long time. So well, we'll let's just find, let him let's, have the mic. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you guys. Uh, so as a lot of Jawheads who know and have gotten to know me over the past couple of years, I think like three and a half, four years, wow. uh, a, lo- a long time, I, I am an animator and illustrator, uh, and that's like one of my biggest passions in life. Uh, and uh, so the announcement is that in uh, a couple of weeks, uh, in the middle of September, I will actually be moving to Los Angeles to further that career of mine, uh, which is great and very exciting. But also uh, on a bittersweet note is also a, a, a departure for me, obviously, because we're a, a champion of Chicago of sorts. You know, I think we think Chicago landmarks are, you know, Sears Tower, Bean and Cinema Jaw. Uh, and I can't pack any of those three things up with me and we're, bring them. We're in the travel brochure <laughs> on Navy Pier. It's like, like you said, the Bean. So the Phil, important parts, yeah. Phil's time with Cinema Jaw is limited. We have n- just a few drawing, weeks left. Drawing to a close, yes. The end of an era. And you know what blew my mind is that Phil never even met Reno. Very, very long time Cinema Jaw listeners will remember uh, Reno from when we got started. Mm-hmm. And you did meet Elias, obviously. I did, yeah. Elias and I worked together for probably like two years, I want to say. Maybe more than that. Wow. But it's, yeah. And before, you know, obviously, um, I say it uh, all the time. Truly, Cinema Draw is one of the greatest nights of, of my week. Uh, I look forward to it every Wednesday, which is the day we record on. Uh, and, and not just um, to you guys, obviously, Matt and Ryan, it's been wonderful working with you and Elias when he was with us. I shouldn't say it like that. It makes it sound like he's dead. Uh, he's alive and he's well. He's dead to yeah. me. <laughs> no, just um, kidding, just kidding. But also to the Jawheads, it's been great, you know, uh, getting to know you guys. And, you know, obviously later tonight we're going to have Flicker Joe on and being able to build up relationships and hear from people. It's uh, thank you. Thank well, you. Well, hey, man, you you are welcome to return anytime you want. You sound like my mom. She's she's <laughs> saying the same thing about me leaving. <laughs> well, we'll definitely have a nice goodbye segment when uh, we have Phil's last show. Yeah. Yeah. And we still have a couple two or three weeks at least right mid-september so maybe closer to five six bittersweet indeed congratulations though phil on on pursuing you know thank you thank you guys the dreams yeah Um, wish you all the best man anything we can do to help was that everything in the fish tank i believe so unless one of you guys is moving nope jump back in will do all right matt bruce springsteen Mm -hmm. the boss also known as the boss has been putting out music since the 70s. His music has reached every part of the globe. The new film, Blinded by the Light, celebrates his music. Really? It celebrates music as a whole and the effect it can have on everyone. So I got out of my hometown, put on a brilliant disguise, and started dancing in the dark on my way to the theater to check it out. I listen to everything. I can feel it all right here. It's like Bruce knows everything I've ever felt. Everything I've ever wanted. My poems, they're not brilliant, but they're mine. You think that this man sings for people like us? But he talks to me. You cannot be serious, mate. My dream was to come here and work hard for my family. If we don't try to fix this, we will lose our son for good. This guy is incredible. You've never heard lyrics like his. Is that Billy Joel? Billy Joel? You try and raise your kids right, Jay. Javid 
is a British teen growing up in 1980s England. He and his family are Pakistani descent. They live in the town of Luton, which is about an hour outside of London. But that distance to London seems so much further to Javid. The 1980s saw racial and economic turmoil in the UK. Being a teenager is tough enough on its own, but Javid must face bullies and ignorant people who do not like him simply because the color of his skin. As an escape and a means to try and stay rational, he writes poetry. However, he has not found his voice just yet. One day at school, a fellow student gives him a tape of Bruce Springsteen, and his eyes, mind, and heart all open tenfold. Javid can relate to Springsteen's lyrics about the working class struggles in his hometown. This inspires him to write about what he knows, what he sees, and what he hopes to find in life. This change in Javid is not seen as a positive by his father, who lives by strict Pakistani traditions. Will Javid conform or continue on with his dream? I'm going to say it right now, Matt. This is the feel-good movie of the summer. You do not have to be a Bruce Springsteen fan to appreciate it. You just have to be a fan of music in general, and who isn't? The filmmakers make great use of the song lyrics, many times scrolling them across the scene as characters race across town or begin to write poetry. Blinded by the Light makes tremendous use of many great Springsteen songs through the years. If you're someone like me who is moved by the idea that art can make a change in this world, then this is a film for you. At a time when we need a happy story, this is one to celebrate. Make sure you see it. You say you don't need to be a Springsteen fan, but are you a Springsteen I fan? I am. I mean, not like a, a, a diehard. I, I do always tell the story that I saw him live solo uh, when I was in college. And I didn't even appreciate it nearly as much as I would, you know, now being an adult and all these years that have passed. Now you'd look at it and, oh, my God, you saw Springsteen solo with a guitar and... I was a fan enough at the time, even in college, to know, hey, you should go see him because he's Bruce Springsteen, you know? But I only knew his, like, greatest hits and, and so forth. I'm still not one of those guys that has, like, all his albums and know, you know, the B-sides. Some of I don't more get it. Eclectic. I'll be honest. I know that he's got this, this like, devout following, and, and people really hold him up on high, and uh, I'm sure he deserves it. I just don't get it. Well, I think... Someone like you, probably after seeing this movie, because they do obviously champion Bruce Springsteen so much, and the lyrics are coming all the time. So they're, they're scrolling him across the screen in fun ways and creative ways. They may be going around a character's head while he's thinking about something um, or scrolled across the, the pavement as they're walking. So you're somewhat sometimes reading. You're kind of like Baby Driver-ish? A little bit, it, it, but, but more... Um, in your face, not in a baby driver, almost hit it in a little way, like it was being this is the graffiti, smart and yeah. graffiti. Nothing like that. It's it's more in the open, so that you're constantly mm. seeing. And that's not a distraction. It's not because um, usually in in the scenes where they're doing it, the characters are in in thought. It's not like they're talking or doing something. It's you know they're Scott walking. Scott Pilgrimy. Well, not even so much that either. Different, just on its own, you know. Hmm. Um, and so you get this idea that the characters are, are feeling the music. A lot of times Javid may have, you know, headphones on and be walking down the street, you know, feeling the music. And they're just got the lyrics going across in creative ways on the screen. And I think reading it and feeling the music, you understand what the connection of all these crazed Springsteen fans suddenly are. You realize like, oh, he's writing about it. We were talking about Bob Dylan earlier. I mean, to talk about a poet, early Springsteen, very much the same, where people were relating to it on like almost like a poetry level, more so than just a, a straight up music level. All music probably is poetry, you know, one form or the other. But I think Springsteen's music just hits a chord with him. No pun intended. Right. All right. Let's break it down a little further here, Ryan. Did you have a favorite scene or, or something you had a lot of trouble yeah, with? There, there's. Uh, I, I really do want to highlight, and we know that he sings "Born to Run," which is 
the, the, anthem. The, yes. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. The state song of New Jersey is a song about leaving New Jersey. But. And it's an incredible scene. It's a fun scene. There, there's nobody that could sit in the theater and not be smiling when that scene happens. But instead, I did want to highlight uh, the very first time uh, Javid actually listens to Bruce. It, he puts it on. He gets this tape, and he puts it in his uh, Walkman, right? And he puts the headphones on. And it's like this really windy night. It's like a storm of wind. It's not quite raining, but it's one of those where it's probably going to rain in the next hour. So everything is really uh, crazy wind. Whipping around. Harsh, harsh wind. And um, he starts to like hear the lyrics for the first time, and they really make that connect with the audience. I think, and that's the special moment when you probably had it because you're you're a big punk fan. If you could probably think back to the first time you heard a song. And it meant something more than just being like, you know, background music. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. the first time you heard lyrics and you related to a song on a sure. more emotional level, everything, right? You just connect it and it's like, oh my God. Yeah. It was now they, I want to sniff some glue by the Ramones. There you go. Yeah. So that moment is captured on film so beautifully when he's listening to it. And all of a sudden it's like everything sort of just opens up his eyes open up to the world because he's listening to bruce and bruce is from new jersey he's pakistani living in england but yet music can connect us much like film can connect us connect us yeah well said brian uh were there, were there any scenes that you had a hard time with slight criticism is there's a scene in which javid's uh family is on the way to a wedding and they come across a protest that's going down the street mm. An important scene. I like the scene, but I, I actually think they could have done a little bit um, background build up to the protest. You know how they do that a lot of times where characters put are talking the, the and TV. you put it on the TV in the back or in the radio. So you get the idea when they're in the car going to the wedding, it's almost sort of clicking for you that the protest is coming. There's not enough of that. So it's sort of like, what's going on here? And it's almost like catches you off guard. Two minutes into the scene, you're like, okay, this is just a random protest. Now I see what's going on here. Slight criticism. Okay. Um, any influences? I actually thought of Billy Elliot, which was a movie where a kid is inspired by the ballet, but substitute Bruce Springsteen for the ballet. Yeah, I mentioned a couple. Would you say those were fair influences? Scott Pilgrim, Baby Driver? A little bit also. Okay. No doubt. Um, Scott Pilgrim. Do you have a movie poster quote? Being bossed around can be fun. All right, that that was fair. I nailed it, Matt. I nailed it. Fair. I wrote another one, and then I came up with that one. My my first one was prepare to be bossed around, which I thought, oh, that's pretty good. But then I thought being bossed around can be fun, even yeah, better. Better. Yeah. What'd you learn? That Bruce Springsteen's early music is fantastic, and it's something I need to go back and listen to. And I'm not just talking the hits. Yes, I know those, Born to Run, and the the ones that I've heard already. But I'm talking about some of the smaller songs that weren't, you know, singles per se that they do play in here that I'd like to go back and like listen to full albums, which I have not done. Yeah, I have not either, man. So I'm with you on that. I'm giving this one three and a half jaws for Blinded by the Light. Like I said, feel good movie of the summer. If you're in a down mood because of all the crap that's going on in the world. Go see this movie, and you will you will walk out feeling good about uh, about life. Boy, we could use some of that, right? Yeah. All right, man. Yes. You've convinced me, Ryan. Well done. Three and a half jaws again for Blinded by the Light. All right, man. It's time to play trivia. We I'm do it ready. each and every week. This is fun because we always give the Jawheads who win the riddle an option: prize pack or take Matt K on in trivia. Flicker Joe won the July riddle, and he chose to take you on in trivia. And uh, Flicker Joe writes us quite a bit. Yeah. And I thought, you know, maybe he would take the prize. He, he won last month's riddle. And he said, no, I would like to take Matt K on in trivia. I'm surprised more jawheads don't take me on. It's almost a guaranteed win. Oh, I don't know. This I is... mean, if you listen to Cinema Jaw, one would imagine you know enough about movies and you're probably going to beat me. Mm, this is going to be interesting. So uh, we're dialing him up on the line. It is a pleasure to welcome Joe Marshall, better known as Flicker Joe, to Cinema Jaw. Hello, everybody. How are you all? Joe, where are you calling in from? Charlottesville, Virginia. Virginia. Nice, man. That's right. Absolutely. I've been living here a year and a half now. 
And, and how long have you been listening to the jaw? A couple of years, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I started about January or February of 2016. I was doing a bunch of uh, drives to, uh, for different places for work, listening to a bunch of books on tape, and I got tired of it. So I was like, you know, I haven't done, I have not tried my hand at podcasting really ever. So, uh, yeah, you know, one thing led to another. And you're a big movie fan, obviously. Yes, you can say that. My wife says that my uh, that movies are my love language. <laughs> I think I have to agree with that. Nice. Um, yeah, that's my, it's my medium, my chief medium for so, entertainment and whatever else. So the Jawheads get to know you. Whose taste do you sort of lean towards the most on the show? You're so fishing for compliments. Ooh. Matt Kay <laughs> or Ry the Movie Guy, yours truly. Yeah, that's... Uh, that, that's. Uh, I was going to say that's not a fair question, but it actually is because I am very close to the middle, because I I don't I go for any film if it's high quality, really, I, it's, it, and that's very subjective, obviously. Um, but I I love me some Marvel. I don't love me some DC so much, to be clear. Um, so I'm I'm selective there, and there are definitely better Marvel films than others. Anyone who watches them knows. But my my heart, my real love is with the smaller industry, the smaller market of indie films. The smaller sometimes the better. It's just like there's more freedom mm -hmm. and you don't have to but get bogged down by producers telling you what to do. You the know, studio and, and, notes. And, right. Yeah. Right. And let's and let's face it. Just like look at the last 20 years of, of Oscar nominees and winners. Not that that is a predicate for everything, but most of them are indie films. And so it just goes to show that there's so many incredible movies. And every year I, I come away with, oh, what was your – people ask me, what was your favorite movie of this past year? Pretty much every time it's a small, really amazing film, mm -hmm. uh, indie films. This small, so anyway, that's – it's a bit of both. I, I can't say for sure, but I really I, – I like a bit of both, but I really love the indie films. So maybe slightly, ever so slightly, a little more towards Ryan, but yes. I love me some big, I'll big take popcorn it. movies. So. <laughs> hey, Joe, since you mentioned it, what, what is your favorite movie running this year on your running list so far? Ooh. Gee whiz. Putting you on the spot. Uh, yeah, you are putting me on the spot. Uh, I will actually, I, I took you, I took your challenge to heart, Matt. I have been watching one movie every week. I nice. thought that was a great challenge. It was a great way to kind of just like keep in the know of what was going on. I have not watched a lot of movies this year. I have hardly been to the theater um, it happens when you have four young children. <laughs> I, I know, man. And you get it, right. I got a couple. And, so, you know, the chances are very low for me to get to the theater. I can't, but I, I can think of, I can't think, I can't honestly, just off the top of my head. Yeah, I can't think. This is a, this is going to predicate how this trivia is going to go, I think. <laughs> oh, well, right. That now, bodes well for nothing's me. Nothing's coming to my brain. Um, anyway, I, you know, I, um, I'm really excited. We'll just put it this way. You guys give off a lot of really good recommendations. I think us. That nice. was really a really fantastic for for a horror film. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Like he's on his A game. He just I hope he keep writing Jordan Peele like every time he, he he's coming up with so many creative ideas and so, you know, hopefully he'll continue to do that. Anyway, yeah, I'd say that if, if on the off off the top of my head, let's put it there. That's a good pick. I think so Nothing too. Nothing wrong with us for sure. No, no. Not, it's not been, at all. It's been a good year for horror sophomore entries. No yeah, doubt, you know. Yeah, you guys you guys reviewed one. I had I skipped the review because I didn't want to hear any spoilers of any kind. When I go into a movie, I don't want to know anything about it. That's mm -hmm. very much rye, I know. Yeah. And so, I'm kind of that way. And um what whoever it was who made Heredity, Hereditary Right. made another movie this year and you made me real stoked to go and see whatever it was. Which Midsummer. One was it? Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see that one. Just like, just like, the, and I'm not a huge horror guy, but the, we got a, like a renaissance of horror movies in the last number of years, sure. really high quality. And so I'm like, I say, if it's high quality, anything, just about any genre of film, I'll see it. And horror is absolutely no exception. So. All right. Amen, brother. I love it. All right. As uh, I mentioned at the top of the show, Matt, in honor of Where Did You Go, Bernadette, mm -hmm. we are playing Go Movie Trivia. Right. Think of movies with Go in the title. 
Joe, you're our guest. You get to choose if you want to go first or let Matt K go first. There oh. are steals, and if you get hung up on any questions, you get one dip into the fish tank for Fill Me In Phil. Okay. If I if I go first, then people can just be like, oh, if I win, they're like, ah, oh, he just won because he went first. It's like if you're white in chess, it's like you won because you're white. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going second. Wow. Okay. He defers. He defers for the challenge, for the I extra like challenge. It. Yeah. Wow. This is oh, great. Why not? <laughs> all right. Uh, all the jawheads listening are, are in Joe's corner. They always are cheering for the jawhead to win. For sure. Right? I, I don't blame them. Question number one over to Matt K in Go Movie Trivia. Mm -hmm. Matt, John Cho and Kale Penn starred in this 2004 stoner comedy about guys wanting some fast food. Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. One to nothing, Matt. Easy to start. Easy to start. We'll go to question two over two, Flicker Joe. This SNL alum took on a bit of a more serious role in this 2010 dramedy, Everything Must Go. Name the actor. SNL actor in terms of dramedy. Frankly, I have never heard of that film before. Everything so Must Go. I'm going to take a complete stab in the dark. Um, and I don't think it was... Heck, I'm not. I'm not even huge on. I'm not even uh, really well informed on SNL actors. Um, some, but you know, it's like the big ones. Everything must go. Who starred in that? I'm just gonna say Kristen Wiig just for the fun of it. Wow, that was gonna be my wow. guess. Incorrect. <laughs> yeah, totally. Incorrect, Matt. You got a chance for a steal here. Okay, Tw 2010 film. Mm -hmm. Everything must go. Mm -hmm. SNL alum. Correct. That was it. Yeah, known for his comedy, took on a bit more serious role in, in this one. Oh, you said his comedy. Mm. Okay. Horatio Sands. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Incorrect. It's not Sandler. We were looking for Will Ferrell. Oh, man. Will Ferrell. And All if right. you haven't seen the movie, Everything Must Go is, is quite good. Okay. So do check it out. Little indie film. One to nothing, Matt. Cool. Question three bounces back over to him. Matt, name the 2010 movie that starred Kira Knightley, Carrie Mulligan, and Andrew Garfield. It was about clones who give up organs to others. Um, don't let me go. Damn. Incorrect. Joe, you got a chance <laughs> for a steal and to tie the game up. 2010 movie, Kira Knightley, Carrie Mulligan, Andrew Garfield, it was about clones who give up organs to others. <laughs> it sounded like Matt's guess was close. I think it was really close now that I'm thinking about so it. So I'm going to guess, don't let go. Is it never let me go? Yes, it's never let me go. Man, oh Can't man. give it to Joe. Wow, tight one here. Still one to nothing. Question four over two. Flipper the only Joe. thing I can think of right now is Pokemon Go. My <laughs> brain is a blank for movie lanes, line uh, tri uh, titles like this. Joe, here you go. I, I think this could be a layup for you. Name <laughs> the Jennifer Garner masterpiece in which a girl makes a wish on her birthday and it comes true. Kind of like the movie Big. 13 going on 30. He knows his Jennifer Garner, right? He knows his <laughs> Jennifer Garner. It That's is true. one to one. We got a tie ball game. Question five back over to Matt Kay. Both contestants have their lifeline. Matt, name the actor who appeared in 1996's Jerry Maguire and 1999's Go. Oh. Oh, my God. I know who it is, but, oh, man, it's going to be tough to come up with this guy's name. Do have a lifeline if you need it. Okay. Name the actor who appeared in 1996's Jerry Maguire uh -huh. and also in 1999's Go. What question number? Five. I don't know if I should use my lifeline here. Mm, man, uh, the guy's name is... Wow. Oh, man. You can see he doesn't want to lose the flicker, Joe. He no, doesn't usually not concentrate that. It's, this It's hard. not that. I just I know this guy. I can see his face. It's the guy. <laughs> he's been in a lot of stuff, but he's like a, sm like a smaller character actor. Need an answer here. I don't know, man. I don't know. Incorrect. Joe, you got a chance for a steal and to take the lead. Well, it doesn't sound like Cuba Gooding Jr. because I think Matt K would have known that. And it definitely doesn't sound like Tom Cruise. And I don't know anyone else in that movie. So 
Into the fish tank. Why the hell? Wow, into the fish tank we go on a steal. I love this. <laughs> Phil, name the actor who appeared in Jerry Maguire and 1999's Go. All righty, Joe. Your clue this week. Hopefully, this clue should give you more help. Gives you <laughs> more help. Wow. Um, he really okay. stressed more. Two names come to mind. Mandy Moore and Dudley Moore. And um, mm. <laughs> it's not Mandy Moore because it's, it's a guy. It's not this Dudley Moore either, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that narrows that down too. <laughs> I didn't think he was in that movie. However, you know, smaller roles, you say, you never know. More, 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 more. And then Rita Moreno, I don't think she was in that line movie either. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to um, say Cuba Gooding Jr. <laughs> Is it Jay? <laughs> yeah, it's Jay Moore. It is Jay Moore. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Go. I could see the guy's face. He's the one that tries to sell him Amway at the end. He yes. was the cop. No, 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 no. You're off. I'm off? No, he was partners with Scott Wolf. Okay. In Go. I'm off then. Yeah. All right. Here it is. One to one, question six, over <laughs> to Flicker Joe. Joe, Sally Hawkins' breakout movie was 2008's Happy Go Lucky. Later, she would star in a film that won the Best Picture Oscar. What film was it? The Shape of Water. That is correct. It is two to one. Nice. Two questions left. Boy, you can cut the tension. In I the still room. have a lifeline, too. You do. You do have a lifeline. Matt, question seven is over to you. In 2006, uh -huh. Will Arnett and Dax Shepard starred in this silly comedy about two guys behind bars. Name the movie. I'm guessing it's not Harold and Kumar go to jail. <laughs> and you're really on an SNL kick, huh? I'll jump in the fish tank. Whoa, into the fish tank we go. Phil, name that Will Arnett, Dax Shepard movie. All righty, Matt, your clue this week. Monopoly does have a card that sends you here. <laughs> I mean, so jail. But I'm guessing so, since the it's go to jail? <laughs> Close, but no cigar there, Matt. It is two to one. Joe, do you know the name of this Will Arnett, Dax Shepard film? Matt was close. <laughs> um, oh, Harry man. and Kumar go to jail. <laughs> do not clue. pass go? Go no. directly to jail? Let's go to prison. Let's go to prison. Monopoly doesn't have prison. It has ah, jail. I tell you. All right. Come on. <laughs> Tough crowd. Phil. That's true. Blame, blame Where did Martha Phil. Stewart go? It's corporate trading. <laughs> blame Phil. Here it is. It's the last question of the game. It's over to Flicker Joe. It's only two to one. Joe can win it on a walk-off, or he can maybe let Matt have a steal. Joe, in 2009, Sam Mendes directed the funny and sweet film Away We Go. It was about a couple expecting their first child. The couple was played by John Krasinski, and this actress, who also appears in Bridesmaids and The Way Way Back. Name the actress. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> you picked the wrong Sam Mendes movie for me, <laughs> I tell you. <clears throat> um, John Krasinski has not been in a lot of movies, at least especially at that time. Um, not, not any good ones, really, anyway. I, I could have told you the License to Wed one, but that, this is a different movie. So, um, and I'm not going to say Jenna Fisher, because I'm sure it wasn't that. This actress appeared in Away We Go. She also appeared in Bridesmaids and The Way Way Back. I've got a confession. I haven't seen Bridesmaids Ooh. yet. Uh, everyone's saying I got it. So, you know, it's on my list, a long list. Put way, way um, back on there, too. Okay. All right. Um, you know. And away we go. That, the person, yeah, there you go. The person that comes to mind is Melissa McCarthy. However, it's probably not a correct, a good guess. She's in Bridesmaids, right? She is. Okay, I thought she was. But frankly, I do not know the cast very well. And I'm out of the fish tank, so pff, I'm going to have to... No, it's not Melissa McCarthy. So I'm going to guess a totally random different person is not Jennifer Aniston, even though she's in my brain right now. No, I'm, I, I honestly have no idea. All right, so I'm going to have to do Melissa McCarthy. Wow, wow, <laughs> incorrect. Matt, you can tie it up. Do you have a guess? I feel bad because Joe mentioned this name earlier. I think it's Kristen Wiig. 
Oh, no way. Oh, Good. really? Incorrect. <laughs> Incorrect. Damn it. <laughs> Joe wins this one. We are looking Ooh. for Maya Rudolph. Maya Rudolph. Okay. Maya Rudolph was in the way, way back? Yes. Huh. Wow. I'll have to look up who she is. <laughs> this was a tough this was a tough uh, really? trivia. Yeah, that's a tough one. There's no doubt. Was Kristen Wake also in the way way back? I don't think so. Okay. I double checked it um to make sure. So she was in Bridesmaids? She, she was. She was in Bridesmaids, yeah. Okay, but she definitely thought. wasn't in a way we go. So that was the main film that I was going for. Uh, there. Uh, Joe does win this one. Virtual handshake, yes, guys. Virtual handshake. Right. Two to one. Yes, if, sir. if it came down to a, a jawbreaker, uh this question would have been over to Joe. Will Arnett funny or stupid? Um <laughs> Better both. <laughs> so I'll say I'll say funny. Sure, he's got his moments. Yeah, he does. He's he pretty does. good. He's all right. The real jawbreaker was this age of Jennifer Garner, closest to Matt. Okay, so she was married to Batfleck. Uh, big in the nineties. I would say she was. So she was thirteen, going on thirty. And was that the late nineties, early two thousands? Forty five. Lock him in at 45. Jody, you got to guess. Um, she was in 13 going on 30 in the mid-2000s. Oh, was I know, it the mid-2000s? Actually. Yeah. Um, and so I am... Um, what, what was your guess? 45? Yeah. All right, I'm going 46. Give that to Flicker Joe. 47 for Jennifer Garner. 47. Damn, right. Damn. You guys were right on top of it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That movie was kind of a giveaway, maybe. <laughs> maybe. She she sure wasn't 30, that's for sure. There well, you go. <laughs> it's good stuff. Well, Joe, we got to thank you for coming on and uh, defeating Matt K in trivia. It's a win for all the Jawheads. Yeah, well, we'll have to. you'll have to rematch me the next time I win the, the, the uh, riddle, I guess. Yeah, absolutely, man. You already answered this riddle's, uh, this, this month's riddle correct. That's, that's true, I did. So. I, was, I didn't, that one was, took a little more effort for me, the last one. Yep. I, I honestly was like... He, he was falsely incriminated by Sean Penn. That's happened one time in movie history, if <laughs> yeah. I'm not mistaken. How is it possible? I, you know, not, not to down on anybody, but that, that to me made it really obvious. And that was a huge movie, and he won Best Supporting Actor for it. So to me, for me, that was a giveaway. But anyway, that wasn't that way for everyone, which is fine, of course. Yeah, Yeah. no, I got a lot of flack. Everybody thought that one was really difficult. It the, was. The Tim Robbins. I, hey, you know, everybody's, everyone knows they're different in movies and stuff. You can't blame anyone for I I, I, I only got caught two for the uh, trivia today. So I can't, I can't point a finger at anyone. There you go. Rye made it really hard. I didn't. I'm just did. write the questions as good as I can. You know, Matt? You do a fine job, Ryan. Right. <laughs> you do a fine job. It was awesome fun, guys. Good time. Uh, thanks for playing trivia, and thanks for uh, being a jawhead. Yes, sir, as always. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a good, have a good uh, show for you. You too. All right. Thanks, Joe. Ah, that was great of Flicker Joe to call in. Fantastic, man. Always great to hear from a jawhead, especially one as longstanding and dedicated as Joe. Just an honor. Totally. Brings us to the end of a great job. This has been a fun it? one. Yeah, man. A lot of, a uh, couple of great movies. Good list. I liked it. I liked it as well. Well, good, Ryan. Good. I'm glad you liked it. Yep. Before we blow out of here, we got some thanks to give. First and foremost, over to our engineer, the guy who made a big announcement today. I know. Fill me in, Phil. Oh, yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, and truly, uh, not just Matt K and Ryan who are in front of me, but thanks to the Jawheads, too. It's been a, a real ride the past couple of years. Matt, we also got to thank our sponsors. Yes, thanks to Overcast and the Chicago Podcast Co-op who help us get cool sponsors like them. If you would like to support Cinema Jaw, the easiest way to do so, leave us a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And while you're at it, click subscribe, one extra button, and it really helps us out tremendously. Until next week, I'm Ryan, the movie guy. I'm Matt K. And, and keep, keep on John about, about the movies. movies.